Welcome to the Interfaith Leadership Forum's third Interfaith Leadership Forum, Building Interfaith Partnerships Beyond Racism and Religious Nationalism. The ILF is a learning platform that aims to make the existing expertise, capacity, and scholarship on interfaith engagement available for the use of clergy, educators, public servants, other interested individuals. The forum is a partnership of the Interfaith Council of Washington, Metropolitan Washington, of the Rumi Forum, and of the Washington Theological Consortium, and it aims to promote pluralism by convening leaders of various religious, ethnic, racial, cultural, and gender backgrounds to exchange ideas and generate an action-oriented agenda. This is our third Interfaith Leadership Forum. It comes at a moment when not only on this very day is the world engaged in an inordinate amount of tension, but our world has been engaged in tensions of various sorts, in particular for the last four or five years. The program this evening will explore the nature of global nationalism as a source of such tensions, not the only one, and its specific manifestation in the US, which primarily takes the form of white Christian nationalism, that is the affiliation of being white and Christian with belonging and mattering. Participants in the program will have a chance to discuss and respond to what they've heard in small group dialogues. This program is indeed a forum for people of faith to learn, to become activated and to feel equipped to respond together effectively. And we are very fortunate in having a series of five different presenters I think it's singularly appropriate that in an interfaith forum, there should be five, since after all that number is so significant in so many different traditions, it is the five books of Moses, the five books of the Torah. It is the five wounds in Christ's body. It is the five pillars of Islam. It is the five great sacrifices in Hinduism among many, many other uses of five. And in Sikhism, of course, the five virtues. And that's just to name, well, five different faith traditions. Of course, I named five, so I could still stick with five. And our five are configured in a particular way. We have a keynote speaker, and we have four speakers who will form a panel, so that in a sense, the configuration is like that of the hand, you know, with a thumb that is connected to but separate from the other four fingers. And in many traditions, it becomes a symbol, the hand does, of the relationship between God and humanity. Humanity represented by four because of the east, west, north, south, four directions of our reality. The thumb in its singularity representing God, connected to and yet separate from the rest of the hand. So with that in mind, we have a keynote speaker. I don't want you, Mark, to think of yourself as God, but you are the keynote, and therefore separate from and yet connected to our other four speakers. And I will introduce each of the four individually. I will first introduce Mark, who will give his keynote, Mark Jürgensmeyer. And I might mention before doing that, that Mark will also be keynoting a conference that will take place on May 23rd, 24th at Catholic University here in Washington, DC. It's a dialogue-based conference, bringing together practitioners and theologians to explore specifically Muslim and Christian models of peace building practice in Washington, DC. And the conference was organized both by the Catholic University of America's Institute for Interreligious Study and Dialogue and John Carroll University out in Cleveland, its Saeed Nursi Chair in Islamic Studies. So I invite you to tune back in to see uh, UA on May 23rd, 24th, and to begin to hear Mark, who will keynote that conference. Mark Jugensmeyer, who is the founding director of the Orphalea Center of Global and International Studies at University of California, Santa Barbara, and more of his bio can be found in the documents that you all possess, will be speaking about the capital insurrection and the global rise of religious nationalism. When he finishes, each of our four panelists will briefly speak, and they will then engage in a panelist discussion, and then we will break out into, well, breakout sessions, where all participants will have a chance to contribute, and then we will reconvene for a kind of summing up of everything. So that's the schedule of the evening. And without further ado, 
I would like to turn the microphone or the platform or the stage over to Mark Jugensmeyer. Mark, it's yours. Well, thank you very much for that most interesting introduction. <laughs> and I'm, I guess I'm the thumb, which is fine with me. Uh, like many of you, I was up most of last night watching the tragic events unfold in the Ukraine. And if you're wondering what, what does that have to do with what we're talking about today, uh, the answer is actually quite a bit. Uh, because you can argue that what we're seeing in Ukraine uh, is a manifestation of a certain Putin penchant for autocratic ethnic nationalism. Uh, and it's true that the Ukrainians are orthodox, but they don't, they're not followers of the Moscow patriarchy. There's the Kiev patriarchy, and there's also a separate uh, Ukrainian autocephalic uh, uh, orthodox church. Uh, so there is a kind of distinction <laughs> there that Putin doesn't like, and he wants to sorry, extend his notion of Russian nationalism into the Ukraine. So it, it does, in some ways, fit into the larger agenda of what we want to talk about today. And that is the global rise of religious nationalism and what these various movements, including movements within our own country, uh, have to do with that, have to do with it. So I want to take you back a year or so ago and the insurrection in the Capitol, which those of you in Washington, D.C. are painfully aware of. And you say, well, yes, it was a diverse group. There's no question about that. There were the Proud Boys and the Patriots, and there were a lot of people who just kind of showed up and were swept into the craziness of the whole situation. Uh, but underlying a lot of the movements was a certain ideology associated with QAnon. Uh, it, it was a kind of crazy conspiracy theory that, as it extremes, is wacky indeed. It had to do with blood sucking uh, pedophiles and you, you don't want to know the particulars, but, but there's a general notion that there is a deep state uh, and that there's a cabal controlling the country. And it's, it's engineered in order to keep out true patriots. And that, of course, is the flag that we're going to try to examine. What is a true patriot? Who are these true patriots? Uh, these are the, the people for whom the the Patriots as a group, and the Proud Boys think that they're defending, uh, and that this guy for a few moments, the QAnon shaman, uh, thought that he was triumphing to the world. Actually, this picture is a kind of interesting. Let me bring this back up again. Uh, you know, uh, this image of the QAnon shaman who was at Nancy Pelosi's speaker seat where Mike Pence had just been a few minutes before overseeing the counting of the electoral votes, uh, was one of these kind of iconic moments from the insurrection last year. And then later in the year, I saw this image. <laughs> and it's like, wait a second, this is the Taliban digging over the president's house in Kabul. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and it struck me that there was a certain similarity between the two. And I know there are a lot of dissimilarities. Uh, for one thing, uh, the Taliban are still there. <laughs> They're still in charge. And the QAnon shaman only lasted a few minutes before he was whisked out. And now he's been, he's facing a 41 month prison session, uh, prison sentence for his actions on that day. But there are some kind of interesting parallels uh, between the insurrection, these two events of last year, the insurrection in the Capitol on January 6th and the takeover of the Taliban in Kabul. Uh, for one thing, there was a distrust in elected officials, a certain kind of uh, reference for autocracy. Uh, and I almost want to call it anti-democratic, except that both the, the people, the insurrectionists of January 6th and the Taliban thought that they were the true Democrats thought that they were the true representatives of the people. And it was the electoral process itself that they thought was deeply corrupt. And so that explained or justified the kind of autocracy to, towards which they turned. And in both cases, their ideology was undergirded by religion. Now, in the case of the Taliban, it's rather obvious. We're going back to the madrasas and the kind of Deobandi brand of Sunni Islam, which in extreme form, the, 
the Taliban had twisted into their own kind of religious ideology that undergirded their leadership. But there was also a, a certain religious dimension to the January 6th insurrection. And again, you see that in, in the Anan ideology, which in some ways is almost a parody of millenary and evangelical Christianity with the idea of the rapture and the coming of Jesus, except in the QAnon version, it's just called the storm uh, and, and, and all of the evils will be purged by the, the, the coming of the new presence, which is not Jesus, but the second administration of Donald Trump. Uh, but any evangelical Christian would recognize in this pattern a kind of similarity. But more than that, there's a general sentiment that God was on their side, that there was a certain kind of religious fervor in the movement. Even Jesus had a MAGA hat uh, at the rallies. And there was a notion that, that Jesus's cross was present. The Proud Boys prayed before they went into the inter insurrection. So this notion of a divine sanction for a movement which was privileging, privileging a certain kind of white evangelical Christian male dominated heterosexual movement uh, is characteristic, not just of the movement in January 6th, but similar kinds of movements around the world. And so both the Taliban and the, and the movement of January 6th had these characteristics of autocratic distrust, religion related ideology, and also an ethnic religious nationalism, because it wasn't just religion, but a, a religion privileging a certain kind of people. In the case of the Taliban, it was uh, the Pashtuns. Uh, if you look at a map of, of, uh, of uh, Afghanistan, it looks like a crazy quilt with different ethnic groups, with different languages, different cultures. I mean, the Pashtuns in the South and, and Baluchs speak uh, different languages from the Uzbeks and the Tajiks in the North. Uh, the Tajiks up, up here are actually Persian, originally from Iran, they're Sunnis, but still Persian. Uzbeks and the Turkmen in this part of Afghanistan are Central Asians. They are Turkish uh, in language and in ethnicity. Uh, the Hazar, <clears throat> middle part of the country, are actually nomads from Iran, they're Shia. Uh, and, and they speak a different language. They speak Dari, which has become kind of the national language of Afghanistan. So uh, the, the conquest of the Taliban, it was really the conquest of Pashtun power over Afghanistan. And in a similar kind of way, what was being asserted in January 6th was the privilege of white Christians in America. And you can see this in the anti-Semitism, for example, in some of these sweatshirts, Camp Auschwitz, and the six million Jews were not enough in the Holocaust. What a horrible thing to put on your sweatshirt. Uh, and Muslims, of course, were also uh, ostracized, or as were Mexicans, Blacks, anyone who fit outside of this kind of model of the white evangelical Christian privileged elite. So together, in both the Taliban and, and the, uh, uh, the QAnon uh, supporting uh, January 6th insurrectionists, we see examples of the global rise of autocratic ethno-religious neo-nationalism. Now you're saying religion and nationalism have always been related. Um, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could say that the very birth of nationalism goes back to the wars of religion in the 17th century, and then there's the peace of Westphalia uh, that then ag agreed in this Latin formula, cuius regio, es religio, who's ever the region there is religion. So the, the ruler could dictate who, what was the, reg the religion of a particular re uh, region. And, and this was the first time really in Europe that there was an attachment between a community and a culture and the statecraft. And so this is regarded often by historians as the birth of the nation state. And so much so that we talk about the nation state system as the Westphalian system, going back to this 
contract back in the 17th century, which had to do with religion. So the assumption was that there were communities of culture that were had similarities. They were peoplehood, and one of the elements of it was religion. So later on in the, in the Enlightenment, when Rousseau talked about the social contract, he could with confidence talk about the contract between a people, a peoples that was defined by a common culture, a common language, a common religion, a common ethnic characteristics. And this kind of worked for Europe in the 17th and 18th century, kind of, <laughs> not perfectly. But as European colonialism spread the idea of nationalism around the world, increasingly, the whole idea of this kind of culture-based, religious-based nationalism got into difficulty. I mean, you see one of the examples of this at the end of World War I, and that's at the end of the Ottoman Empire, when the French and the and the British decided, well, you know, you've got this empire, now we should create nation states because that's the way the world should be. So they started carving up the area in the nation states. And so now suddenly you have Turkey, uh, largest chunk of property in the Ottoman Empire becoming its own nation. The uh, young Turks raced in to try to ethnically cleanse that area, get rid of those pesky Armenian Christians and Greeks and subdue those Kurds and kind of make, you know, Turkey for the Turkish and, and you had all of these other areas where they it didn't quite fit. I mean, Syria, you had these Sunni Arabs on one side, but you also had Alawites who were kind of Shia and Christians over here. And then Lebanon, oh my God, you've got Christians and Druze and you've got Shia and Sunni and we'll put them together. In Palestine, yeah, we've got Sunni and, and Christian Palestinians, but now you have Jewish settlers coming. Let's all make that one country. It, and then Iraq, you've got oh, Kurds up here, and you've got Sunni Arabs over here, and Shia. Well, let's just all make one country of it. The problems we have today in the Middle East, all of them go back. All of them go back to the attempt to try to create nation states out at the end of the Ottoman Empire. And, and religion becomes a part of that difficult equation and attempts to try to recreate nationalism are often attempts to try to redefine nation states in terms that didn't quite exist before, uh, trying to cram them into this idea of a religious nationalist model. So if that wasn't problem enough, now we have a whole new issue and that's globalization. Because in the era of globalization, where everybody can live everywhere and everything is made everywhere and, and you have a porous boundaries in terms of politics and communication and, and mobility, then the whole idea of nationalism becomes more problematic. I mean, just think of the torrent of refugees that have come out of Syria and other places pouring into Europe and now they want to be part of Europe. And the Germans are looking around and said, they don't look German to me, um, but they're there. And okay, <laughs> they're German, aren't they? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> increasingly, this is the problem around the world to try to understand how to understand nationalism based in part on cultural ident identifications in a world where that no longer makes sense. So it makes sense that there's a rise of ethno religious neo nationalisms attempts to try to reassert the primacy of a particular ethno-religious group to define a nation state. Uh, and often this results in pretty awful things and very se severe and kind of autocratic patterns. One of the first, of course, was the Islamic revolution in, in Iran, which is not just attempt to deal with the defects of the Shah, but also as the Ayatollah said, to deal with West toxification to try to purge Iran of elements of the West to make it a truly Shia cultural nationalism again, uh, if it ever really was in exactly the way that the Ayatollahs uh, formatted. I mean, that's one of the curious things about this revival of, of religious nationalism. Remembers often past that never quite existed in the way that they did in the past. 
But nonetheless, uh, the struggles continued. And then in the 80s, it was Afghanistan and the Mujahideen battling against the secular forces. Across the border in the Punjab, this was where I came in the picture as somebody who lived and fought in the Punjab for a number of years and seeing the rise of Sikh nationalism, Sikhs would say, uh, you know, Pakistan, mu Muslims got Pakistan, uh, Hindus got Hindustan, it's a word for India. What do we Sikhs get? We should have Sikhistan or Khalistan. And for many people that seemed to be persuasive that if, all right, if you're gonna define nationalism in these terms, what about us? <laughs> and this is a pattern that you hear in other parts uh, of the world as well. In Israel, the beginning of 1990, two movements were occurring, among the, one among the Palestinians, among, among the Israelis. I, I went to Israel at the time to talk with Mayor Kahane, uh, a leader of the Koch party, who was trying to insist that a secular Israel was not what he had in mind. And even though the Constitution of Israel is basically a secular document, he said, no, Israel will not be Israel until it's biblical Israel, which meant, at least in his terms, getting rid of those pesky Palestinians. Now, Mayor Kahane is gone, but his grandson, Mayor Ettinger, is the leader of the Hilltop Gang, and firebombing Palestinian homes to try to force them to leave. He's regarded as a Jewish terrorist by, by Netanyahu. He, very few Jews do support him. Let me make that absolutely clear. And yet there is this dimension of Israeli nationalism right now. And then on the other side of Palestine, the frustration with the secular movement led by, Araf, by Arafat gave rise to a whole new movement led by this guy, Sheikh Yassin. And when I went to talk to him in early 1990s, he said something remarkably similar to what Kahani said, only about Palestine. The Palestine will never be free until it's a Muslim state. In both sides, the religionization of nationalism, the religionization of the conflict, which hardened the conflict in, in, in the region, across the border in Egypt, the, Muslim Brotherhood founded in, by Hassan Obama in the 1930s, finally gaining strength and fairly recently. And a new phenomenon of transnational uh, religious nationalism, Muslim nationalism led by Al-Qaeda, a kind of fantasy movement, but given strength in a different way by ISIS, which was also more than in a particular country. It was a kind of regional nationalism, a new caliphate, an imagined idea of um, uh, imagine idea of, of, you know, a kind of grand caliphate nationalism. When I talked with refugees in near Mosul and, and some of the militants who were formerly part of the movement, uh, and part of arrangements helped by, uh, by uh, Dr. Amelie, which I greatly appreciate, uh, they convinced me that ISIS was, regardless of whether we think of it as a, um, as an extremist apocalyptic movement, a Sunni movement, a movement for Sunni empowerment. And even though we think of it in religious terms, and it certainly has that dimension, uh, it, it is seen by, by particularly by its, its supporters, even those who are not all that religious, as a movement that will give Sunnis some voice, give them some dignity. And you can't understand ISIS without understanding that. You can't understand the Boko Haram in Nigeria without understanding that it's, they're not just religious extremists. They feel that they're protecting the people of Northern Nigeria, the Muslims against the Christian South. There's an ethnic nationalism issue at stake in an ethnic nationalism conflict. And even in Buddhism, you, the, the, you, Buddhists are the peaceful people. I mean, what are they doing with religious violence? It, when you see these parades of, of, of Buddhist monks marching against Muslims, setting fire to houses, burning Muslims alive, you're saying, how could this possibly, how could this possibly be? And this monk, Ashin Viratu, was put on the cover of Time magazine as the Buddhist face of terror. So soon after that, when I was in Myanmar, I went up to Mandalay to talk with him. And uh, when I came into his office, he, he looked at me and kind of giggled and he said, Did, do I look like a terrorist? <laughs> and I wanted to say, yeah, actually, um, you look like most of the terrorists that I've talked with. 
which is to say utterly banal. What's a terrorist? And he kept on saying, oh, we Buddhists are nonviolent. I said, yes, but you feel like you have to defend yourself. He said, well, yes, against those enemies of Buddhism. And I said, who are those enemies of Buddhism? And he said, Muslims. Those Muslims are out to get it. And he had this big map of the world up on his wall that showed a huge wash of Islam. And then Burmese Buddhism, which he regarded as a certain kind of religion, is this tiny little drop that was about to be engulfed by Islam. So this awareness of the world sometimes has negative as well as positive uh, aspects of it. And this brings us, of course, to what's happening in America and in Europe today and the rise of the militant Christian right. It's been going on for a while after all, the Aryan nation and then Timothy Mouvet was a religious uh, a nationalist. If you read his writings and read the book, The Turner Diary, which is his favorite book, he thought he was saving Christendom. Exactly the same thing that Andres Breivik in Norway thought he was saving when he attacked those, those kids in a youth camp uh, near Oslo. He thought he was saving white Christian Christianity, white Christian nationalism uh, from the ravages of those Muslim hordes. Uh, whatever sad and strange, perverse understanding of history, but is, of course, linked with events of our current day. And it continues to resonate with the kind of notion of white pride worldwide. <clears throat> I mean, the ideas of Timothy McVeigh, the approach of Andres Bravik was picked up by Brandon Tarrant, a Australian who was in New Zealand when he attacked two mosques in Christchurch in New Zealand. Uh, this idea that you got to assert white pride worldwide is a fearsome aspect of ethno-religious nationalism today. And you see it throughout Europe with the rise of new right-wing movements in Germany and Denmark and in Austria. And, oh yes, in Russia where Putin has gathered strength with uh, from the Russian Orthodox Church as his new allies and supporting his own idea of a new ethnic nationalism, Russia that will replace this uh, the USSR and incorporate, he hopes, a country like Ukraine, at least is what he's trying to, trying to establish today. And of course, the Muslims become uh, a target for this new uh, Christian-based ethno-nationalism that's uh, ravaging, ravaging Europe. I I India, a rising Hindu nationalism, uh, a new, new resurgence of nationalism in, in Japan, even in Canada, the trucker strike recently had a dimension of, of religious nationalism uh, related to it. Canada is supposed to be the nice part of North America. <laughs> Why would they be involved in every part of the world is affected in some way by this global rise of ethno-religious neo-nationalism. And it's a part of globalization because in a global era, we have three main crises, a crisis of authority, who's in charge, a crisis of identity, who are we really? And if there is no longer a strong sense of nationhood, a crisis of security, how can we be safe? And religion provides answers to all those questions. You know who's in charge, you know who you are, you know how to be secure. And that's a good thing, but you can also see how religion would be weaponized. And these sentiments of religion will be used in a political way in, in some very uh, ugly ways indeed. So what is the future? <laughs> well, movements fade away. I, you know, I just finished a book looking at how uh, movements like ISIS and, and other groups uh, eventually uh, erode mostly from within. They're often dead before uh, they're demolished uh, from the outside by the police or the army by some other force uh, because of internal dissension and because of distrust and loss of faith in the movement. So these particular movements, the Taliban and the Proud Boys and the uh, QAnon, they're not going to last forever. But in the long run, they are, of course, symptoms of a much deeper problem. And that's the whole movement towards nationalism. And, and the movement towards tribalism. And, and is this kind of nationalistic tribalism, is that our future? I, I look with some trepidation at the upcoming elections uh, in the United States, uh, the next two, and whether this will be move us back or move us forward in terms of uh, America's uh, trajectory with uh, 
nationalistic tribalism. But I also notice that there are other, there are other elements in our contemporary scene. And that is a sense of global citizenship, a sense of being proud of and identified with the global community, being concerned about the environment, being concerned about human rights, being concerned about those things that affect all of us on this planet, dealing with pandemics and dealing with issues of global uh, warming, things that affect us all. I see this in my students, I see this in, in the community of people who are on the Zoom screen today. The, there is this dimension of the future. And so the question is, are we headed towards a tribalistic future? Or are we headed towards a future of global citizenship? If you wanna know the truth, what I really think, <laughs> I think, I think we'll be like in the past when we faced a difficult decision. When you face a fork in the road, we take it. <laughs> By that, I mean, both things will happen. We continue to be in tension. We will continue to have both a sense of tribalism and a sense of global citizenship uh, in contradistinction to each other. Uh, and this will be the tension of, of our future that somehow we will muddle through, but we will muddle through with new challenges because global warming has already presented itself as the existential threat uh, of this century. The rising of seawaters, the fires that go out of control, the shifting of the polar vortex, which has affected all of us the last week or so throughout North America with this terrible cold. Uh, these, these are just harbingers or something even more horrible to come. And there might be other perils, uh, an accidental nuclear attack uh, as a result of this Ukrainian uh, uh, situation or a, a deep depression, again, perhaps caused by Ukraine. There are other things that we will have to deal with as a human community that may force us together in ways, but also may tear us apart again in other ways. So yes, I'm concerned about the rise of religious nationalism uh, within the larger context of the fate of humanity, uh, which is to say that kind of like question about one's relationship on Facebook, uh, it's complicated. Uh, we have both the hope uh, and the harm of the future. Uh, we have both the destruction and the possibility of a renewed optimism to face in the coming days. Uh, and so with that somewhat qualified optimistic note, uh, I'll turn to our questions and our discussion and thank you very much for being attentive uh, in my opening comments. Mark Jugensmeyer, thank you so much for giving us so much to think about. We have a lot to think about. And we uh, will follow our thinking that has derived from Mark's presentation with more thinking that will derive from a series of four presentations from four panelists. Again, I remind everyone that uh, their bios are more readily available. I also want to remind everyone that both the keynote and these panels are recorded, but that when we turn to the breakout sessions, they will not be recorded. So you should feel completely comfortable if you're worried that you would be recorded. Having said which, I want to begin by uh, introducing our first panelist, who is Rabbi Jack Moline, the president of the Interfaith Alliance. And Jack is going to address the topic of the interfaith imperative for about 10 minutes, and we will move on from there. Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ori, and thank you, Mark, for an extraordinary presentation. Um, I, I, I'm a little reluctant to correct you on one thing, but I'm, I'm going to do it because it, it illustrates your point. Uh, the name of Mayor Kahana's party in Israel was Hebrew. It was Kach, not Kach. And Kach is important because um, Kach in, in Hebrew means this way. In other words, this is how it ought to be. When Kahana was thrown out of his own party, uh, he started a new party that was called Kahana Chai, which means Kahana lives, also pronounced Kach, but in this case, it means power. So this is the way it's going to be, and this is the power. That's what Mer Kahana's religious uh, presumption was all about. But uh, that's the limit of my expertise over yours. So 
Um, I will turn now to my my prepared thank you, remarks. Thank you for that helpful helpful uh, correction and, and addendum. I appreciate it. No charge. No charge. <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever attended a traditional Jewish worship service. Because Jewish prayer is liturgical, the text of our, our prayers doesn't change much, particularly on weekdays. Worshippers recite Hebrew words at breakneck speed, often accompanied by a rhythmic rocking motion with their bodies. It is called davenin. I have a friend who describes davenin as saying very important things much too fast. I have only eight or 10 minutes to cover my topic, and you will find that my lifetime of davenin has prepared me to cover the interfaith imperative on this panel. It's my belief, if not all religions, as well as the less mystical secular philosophies that, that uh, exist to help members of the human family, uh, it's my belief that they, they are there to help the human family overcome the fear and insecurity that comes with being alive. From almost as soon as we're able to form independent thoughts, we worry that we will be abandoned and alone. Those of you who are blessed with children will remember that delightful period of infancy and toddlerhood when your child perfected the death grip on your neck whenever a stranger entered the room or when you had to leave the house for work or for an evening with friends. Our religious traditions pick up where that fear and insecurity leave off to assure us that there is indeed a way for each of us to be assured that we have a secure place in the world we traverse and mostly an eternal place in the world beyond this life. If. There's always an if. If you behave properly. If you believe properly. If you treat your own properly. If you treat others properly. If you love properly properly. We would be in great shape, all of us, were it not for two undeniable truths. The first is, your if is almost certainly different than my if, meaning that we return to the insecurity of when that stranger walked into our home and tried to pry us from our parents' embrace. And the second is that every religious tradition and philosophy is a human construct and it relies on faith, famously described as a belief in the unseen. The result is a quivering, almost rhythmic rocking motion that underpins our existence as we, expect, as we express quickly and quietly our hopes and desires that the organizing principles of our beliefs will not be undone by the experience or the beliefs of others. Some of us set about convincing others that we are right, or at least that we are more right than they are. Some of us try to demonstrate the rectitude of our worldview by behaving in a way we consider to be virtuous, no matter the behavior of others. And some of us just get mad and try to squelch any other way of behaving and believing that does not meet our approval. The result, unfortunately, is the reinforcement of our collective fear and insecurity. And for the sake of what is left of my time, I want to suggest that the only way for us to avoid constant conflict and its resultant harm to our sense of place in the world is to, to, to agree to bring our diverse ways of thinking and believing to a neutral place in the public square and, and here I'm going to slow down because it's the only important thing I'm going to say, and listen carefully and openly to each other. Listen carefully and openly to each other. It doesn't matter if you do any convincing or if you're convinced. What, what is important is only this. We must understand that we all experience the fear and insecurity as the price that we pay for consciousness, consciousness of our own fragility and our own limited lifespan. We are all in this lifeboat together, 
and our best chance of not scuttling it is to pull together rather than rowing in different directions. The great blessing Americans have is that our founders intuited that the only way for a diverse nation of diverse believers to accomplish this task is by the free exercise of conscience and the restriction of government from imposing any system of belief, any system of belief, even in the smallest way on its population. And I will insert my one commercial here. That's what Interfaith Alliance has protected with its every effort for more than a quarter of a century. You know, if you visit the National Mall, you will see it surrounded by buildings and structures that attest to the values of this country. On one side of the mall, it is bounded by Independence Avenue, and on the other side by Constitution Avenue, the law. In that space between freedom and law, you will see representations of all the things we value justice, education, treasury, industry, agriculture, health and human services, art, science, history, law, legislation, and the executives who administer them past and present. The women and men who defended them all, they're all represented on the mall. There's even a carousel to make clear to, that our devotion is to future generations. But the one thing you will not see on the National Mall, the one thing you will not see on the nation's front lawn is any monument to faith. When you come to visit that open space, that free marketplace of ideas that we've established in our nation's capital, you are invited to bring your beliefs with you and to take them with you when you leave. It is the interfaith imperative that you do both. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Quite stirring indeed. And a perfect lead in to our next speaker, who is Charles Watson Jr., who is the Director of Education at the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. And Charles is going to talk about doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, apropos of our nation's past diverse perspectives on itself and what constitutes itself. Manifest Destiny and Christian Nationalism, nothing new. Charles, unmute yourself, and it's yours. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, whenever I do uh, any type of speaking engagement, I like to let people know how I enter the room. And I enter the room as an African-American male, uh, heterosexual, single, uh, veteran, all of these things from a small town in Georgia with four stoplights. All of these things are important into knowing who I am, but also it's important to how I see a vision. And I like to know that about everybody else because it gives me a perspective of where they're coming from and a value of it. It's all value the same, whether it's different than mine or the same as mine, it's still value. And so I'm gonna try to, in a quick segment here, give us a little history. And most of us uh, may know the, the history of these three, uh, identities that I, I talked about here, the doctor of discovery, I call that an identity, uh, the manifest destiny and Christian nationalism, and show that until we as Americans are able to tell the truth about these three things and their connection and how they've built upon each other, we cannot solve the problem of white supremacy, racism, and uh, the things that Mark and, uh, and Jack have talked about before uh, I spoke here. How do we come together as an interfaith group? So a little background, quick history. I'm gonna do it, do it fast, as, as Jack said. Uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna slow down in the important parts. So the doctrine of discovery, uh, many of us know that that uh, emerged in sort of like the 15th century from the paper bulls, which were official decrees from the Pope. Um, and one decree in particular, from uh, Pope Nicholas V, uh, Papal Bull, uh, Diversa, Diversa, uh, Dumb, excuse me, Dumb Diversa, Diversa, which pretty much uh, was a decree that said and granted permission to King uh, Alfonso the V of Portugal to invade, search, capture, vanquish, subdue uh, the Sacrians. And at that time, that's what I think that's what they called. Uh, 
uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters, and pagans and other enemies of Christ. Uh, and those pagans were described as uh, anybody that was non-Christian and those who could be targeted for perpetual uh, slavery. Now for our African bodies, or, or our African brothers and sisters, uh, this was just them being seen as a commodity uh, to be taken for the pleasure or the profit of the European Christian body, seen as one made in, seen because they were not one that was actually the uh, body of Christ or seen as what God would look like. So savages is what we've, we've heard in, in different in historical backgrounds. For our indigenous brothers and sisters in the Americas, it meant that they could come and discover <laughs> uh, land that was already occupied by uh, those in there and claim it for God in their country. Um, and I like to say here, the biggest lie of Christopher Columbus. Um, and we can talk about that in the breakout room if, if we want to in there. But from, from that, we also had laws and cases that were actually built from the doctrine of discovery. Uh, we have the case of Johnson and McIntosh in 1823, where Chief Justice Marshall just said, hey, uh, the ultimate domain is for uh, those who are here that uh, conquered this land, basically. Uh, there is no sovereignty in, in you being here first. Uh, and so you can't claim occupancy of this land. And by doing that, uh, he kind of said that the United States became independent in 1776. Uh, it retained the British right of discovery and also acquired Britain's power and dominion. So basically, it doesn't matter that you were here, Native Americans. Uh, this is ours, and we're going to take this land, and there's nothing you can do about it. Kind of brings us into the fold of Manifest Destiny. Uh, now, after the Second Great Awakening, there was an idea we need to spread even further uh, west. And with that, the 19, early 19th century, you still, you, you find this uh, manifest destiny, which essentially states that the, the nation of America had a God-given right to rule the entirety of the Northern American continent, which is interesting to me because now you're coming from a European idea of, okay, this is what you can do. Now, once you get to America, we got to redefine this again into manifest destiny. Now that we're here, we should take over the Americas, all of North America. And what, what Europe has, eh, we're, we're a nation now. We're our own nation now. We're, we've separated from uh, what we did there, but still have a connection to that uh, doctrine of discovery. Um, and that way, that's where you find the idea of a city on the hill, uh, the, the religious nature of, of those type of words, and American exceptionalism. Uh, was promoted in during this time. And if we don't let our history books erase it, you will see the actual evidence of this by uh, the Trail of Tears. Uh, you see evidence of this by the Dred Scott decision uh, in the early uh, 19th century that basically ruled that the word citizen didn't apply to Africans or natives of this land. So we're, we're, right now we're in a place where you're building off of something that came from a, a, nation, a, a global nationality of Christianity coming to new lands. Now we're making it even more exclusive. It's just for us that's, that are here in America and, 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 and not even here in America that were native here, but the ones that came here after and, and discovered it. And so you saw that all through Andrew Jackson signing of the Indian Removal Act, 1830s, all the way up to, I would say, even Jim Crow. And then you have this thing called Christian nationalism, which has built upon that by saying, you know what? God ordained us, us to come over here. And when I say us, I'm saying the European uh, Christian that could come over here, have the, have the uh, land, then say that it's, it's, it's for us to spread this across the land because it's if you look like us and believe like us, you should be good. But now we're seeing something that's turning. We're getting more people here and it's getting diversified and that's too much for us. So now we have to say, you know what? In order to be a good American, you have to be a good Christian. In order to be a good Christian, you have to be a good American. And now we have this distortment of both of those things in order to cover what is really the white supremacy that has been going on and colonization that has been going on since the beginning and 
even back further than the dot and the discovery. But for this for this time period, we're just going to stay in those three. And so you have Christian nationalism showing itself in Charlottesville, Virginia. You have Christian nationalism showing itself uh, with uh, Dylan Roof. If you read his manifesto from uh, Mother Emanuel uh, Church in Charleston, South Carolina, where he was he was just actually saying blacks have done these atrocities to whites. So we need to attack the blacks in this community. And, and, and not only the blacks, but the blacks that even were in a church, in a Christian church. But if you don't see these people as human and you don't see these people as uh, people that's supposed to be here and you don't see these people as Americans, then you can go and attack them. And we see it, I take it even further as saying voting rights, uh, breaking the rules, gerrymandering, gerrymandering of districts to make sure that certain people are voted out, certain people are kept out uh, in those districts. We see it in January 6th, and we also see it now in the trying to abolish of critical race theory, even though it's not in the uh, school system, uh, don't want any of this history in there. And so for me, in order for us to actually move forward and do better, we have to recognize the history of our nation, the doctrine of discovery, the manifest destiny, and now the Christian nationalism and realize it's nothing new and realize in order to combat it, we have to uh, be truthful about the history of how we got to this point in order to uh, diminish it from uh, spreading further and turning into something else in the future. And I look forward to talking with the other panelists and, and Mark about this. Thank you, Charles. That was a terrific history lesson. Um, yeah, history, as we all know, is something which we are doomed to repeat as far as its negative parts when we try and ignore or distort it. And, and appropriate because uh, Mr. Putin is doing the same with respect to the history of Ukraine and Russia. So you're in, in line with today and in line with the discussion this evening in line with everything. So you're in line. Perfectly. Yeah. And one last thing I would drop in, just like Please. I said, one, one promotional thing, I'm going to drop it in the chat. Uh, our organization, Baptist Joint Committee, just did a, a report on the January 6th insurrection. So if you don't have it, I would like to drop it in the chat here for everybody. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this leads me to our third speaker, who is Maggie Siddiqui, the Senior Director, Religion and Faith at the Center for American Progress. And Maggie will be speaking about the pro-democracy faith movement. And again, I remind you, everyone's bios are to be found. I don't want to waste their time by repeating stuff you can read for yourself. Maggie, please take over from me. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this. And uh, just to hear from the panelists before me um, has been an honor. So just grateful to be a part. Um, I want to start by uh, uh, taking us back in time to what feels like a lifetime ago, but was only two years ago. It's not a year many of us like to remember, but I think it's helpful <laughs> to, to ground um, some of my remarks here. Um, as you may recall, that was a time of um, intense fear for both the future of our nation and for our democracy. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know even if COVID was transmitted through surfaces or through the air, organizations that would typically canvas for a candidate or simply to get out the vote were unable to safely do so. Ballot drop boxes were not at all common practice in any previous election. There was a lot of confusion, not only about our health and safety, but also what um, the presidential election would look like and what, uh, what would result in our democracy. Um, violence against Black Americans then led justifiably to widespread protests across the country. Meanwhile, we saw other groups protesting at hospitals and local governments for imposing public health mandates that attempted to curb the spread of COVID. And amidst all of that, unfortunately, where faith in public life was often most visible is in the places where it shocked us. So some of the images that Mark shared earlier, right? The crosses, the Jesus save signs, the, the violent insurrection on January 6th. Um, that is often what people remember when they think about what is the intersection of faith and democracy? How do people of faith engage around these big questions? Um, 
And as has already been shared, so I don't want to be overly redundant, the anti-democratic movement really is premised on the notion of white Christian nationalism, this unholy alliance of white supremacist and Christian nationalist views. And as Charles shared, they're very much uh, inextricable in many ways. The idea that this country was built for and belongs to white Christians, namely white Christian men. But that, that shocking story, which, which is one that requires a lot of attention as we attempt to protect our democracy, is, a, is, is far from the reality of how many religious communications, in fact, uh, communities rather, in fact, I might say the majority of religious communities really are engaging or want to engage around American democracy. And it's really important that we center that religious story of the past two years, the story of diverse religious communities, people with um, even different political persuasions, vastly different geographies and racial and ethnic backgrounds, who all came together in 2020 and since then in brand new ways to address a common threat. We saw unprecedented organizing in 2020 around the election, even amidst the pandemic, or perhaps because of it, um, it, you know, because of the voter suppression, because we had a sitting president threatening to thwart election results if they were not in his favor. And they did so because people who hold a faith tradition or faith values of any kind do engage with their faith every single day in public life. Their faiths inform why they call for voting rights, why they advocate for racial justice, for economic justice, and so on. Um, and I think, it, you know, as I said, this is a reality that I think we often forget in the trauma of those kinds of images of uh, faith taken to this uh, extreme form of nationalism. Um, so at the Center for American Progress, we wrote a uh, report about how religious communities engaged in what we call the pro-democracy faith movement. Um, we uh, we conducted a number of interviews in 2020, in summer of 2020, before many of the, the events that followed, including the election and the insurrection. Uh, much of what we found ended up being like prophecy. Um, and we published shortly after the insurrection. And I, I can link to that in the chat at the end of my remarks. So the reason why we wanted to look at the pro-democracy faith movement in that time was because often we feel there are too many barriers to multiracial, multiracial, multi-faith work. There's too many barriers to, to transcend in our differences in, in how we talk about things and our theology, how we find meeting, what our uh, life experiences are, that that's, that's too difficult. We do not have the advantages of the fairly demographically homogenous religious right. Um, but we do have uh, you know, a number of shared values that did that really led people to come together in new ways around the pro-democracy faith movement. And that's what we wanted to explore. How is it that those of us with very different backgrounds are, are able to come together and what does that look like? Um, so the central premise undergirding the pro-democracy faith movement is that all people are, um, are equal and therefore should have equal voice in their own governance. And underlying that central premise are five values that unite this movement and that we uncovered through these interviews with diverse groups of religious leaders from across the country. The first value was that building an inclusive democratic movement, uh, sorry, the first value was to build an inclusive democratic movement in order to build a more inclusive democracy. There was a recognition that in order to be part of a successful movement to build a more inclusive democracy, the movement in itself must be more inclusive. That is to say, we have to practice what we preach. We can't be truly all about inclusion and everyone uh, having equal voice in our country if that is not the case in the movement itself that is advocating for that. We must fully embrace people of minority religious traditions and the non-religious, the full racial diversity of America, people of all sexual orientations and gender identities within our movements themselves. And as an example of that, the second value was to center the experiences of Black Americans. So for some Americans in our pro-democracy faith, faith movement, the kind of democracy that we aspire toward is what the founding fathers envisioned. That's sort of our model of what to advocate for. But for others, we're keenly aware that the founding fathers' vision for American democracy did not include 
many of us, did not include Black Americans, it did not include women, it did not include people who did not own land. And so centering the experiences of Black Americans, as was shared with us from many faith leaders in this movement, really allowed us to reflect the deep learnings of a community that for centuries has forged democracy that is more inclusive than it was before. Black leaders, often Black faith leaders, have long led our nation in envisioning a more inclusive, more democratic America, envisioning a better reality for themselves and for all of us that had never existed and then helping make that a reality. Third, uh, third value, grounding democracy in a shared sense of community. There is a hyper individualism that we are contending with as a country. A few of the faith leaders that we spoke with um, questioned whether the problem resulted from, in part from an extreme religious interpretation of individual salvation over communal salvation. An emphasis that could lead one to saying the individual is always more important than community. But under this hyper-individualistic narrative, if only my freedom matters and my voice matters, then naturally my only interest in our democracy is making sure it allows me to do what I want when I want, regardless of how it harms others. And that hyper-individualistic reality, it means I should be allowed to enter unmasked, for example, COVID positive into a public place, even if someone else might die as a result. And if I'm part of a majority group in the country and the status quo is working for me, then it might become in my interest to suppress the rights of others, including others' voting rights. But if we see one another as Americans, as a shared community, we will come to very different conclusions. And we'll believe and understand that our success as Americans is only achievable if our full community succeeds. The fourth value of the pro-democracy faith movement was in being political, but not partisan. So many faith communities often feel reluctant to engage in politics or matters of public policy. They worry that they will mire their communities in disagreement. Um, but the way that we ensure our neighbors are able to have basic rights, basic freedoms, and basic necessities are played out in the public square. That means uh, in politics as well. So by necessity, we must be political. And many religious and faith communities have feel called to engage in politics and public policy for that reason. But the work of saving our democracy is nonpartisan and must remain as such. The anti-democratic movement has sadly become a highly partisan effort, but there is no reason for the pro-democracy movement to be as such. Fifth, meeting the urgency of the moment. Um, the anti-democratic movement, uh, including white Christian nationalists, is not going away. Voter suppression efforts have intensified and are succeeding through ger gerrymandering and bans on ballot boxes and more. There's a lot of work to be done and religious communities are continuing uh, to respond alongside others even as we speak. So in 2020, we saw the way, the way this movement met the urgency of the moment. It was through voter registration and get out the vote efforts reimagined in this COVID environment combating voter suppression, countering disinformation, poll monitoring, including to deter violence, literally training to put their li lives on the line, put their bodies on the line at, at polls if need be, uh, and how to prevent mass violence, advocating for pro-democracy legislation, voting and democracy education, working to ensure elected officials um, were, were going to accept the results and peacefully transfer power to whoever the winner of the 2020 election was. Those efforts were largely successful. They were largely successful. We did have a peaceful transfer of power, but they have those threats have not gone away. And so now with, in 2022, the midterm elections upon us, faith groups and others are re-engaging in much of these same activities. Um, many have never stopped because they have been advocating for federal voting rights um, legislation. They have been pushing back against voter suppression over the last two years. Um, and a lot of more work is going to be done and we're going to see even more. So I wanted to share that because I think it, it, amidst all of the challenges upon us, um, it's important to really keep um, front and center that um, really powerful and, and true story of religious communities engaged around the future of democracy 
one that I think will only deepen and grow. And I will drop some links in the chat for you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maggie. I'm, and I'm glad, of course, that you used the number five as a structure for your talk. But the number four is also important. The fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Dalet, derived from the image of a door for which the word is Delet. So our fourth speaker, Simran Singh, you've got a huge responsibility to further open the door to our conversation by delivering your remarks on religious liberty and the shortfall of advocacy. Simran Singh is the vice chairman of the International Religious Freedom Secretariat, and to him I now turn over the microphone. Simran? Thank you, Ori. Thank you, everyone, for being here and to this incredible panel. And Professor Jurgensmeyer, who enjoys tremendous respect within our community. Um, and um, well, let me give you a really quick background on why I entered this religious freedom work. I was a young executive in, in what was the largest privately held security company supporting the US government. And after 9-11, after the firm sent me here from New Mexico was the largest privately held company in the state. It sent me here from New Mexico to DC to work with our clients there. We, were, we, had, we had over 5,500 police officers retired protecting federal judges. The last contract I won for them was the El Chapo trial protection, a trial in Brooklyn, where we had hundreds of armed retired U.S. Marshals, um, uh, you know, protecting the rule of law, a big seat value. The New York Times ran a front page article um, on us with uh, somebody who looks like me and listing our security contracts. And they said Sikhs found their calling in, in homeland security. And at the time, we couldn't wear, wear turbans in, uh, in police or, or army uniforms, even though there are pictures of, of World War I army soldiers, US army soldiers with turbans, even though hundreds of thousands of Sikhs died fight, or were injured uh, fighting the Nazis, Rome was liberated by a Sikh regiment. We couldn't get back in uniform here. And so we thought uh, having a big security company at least would show our kids, and there are half a million Sikhs in the US, that we could still participate um, in, in this way. We couldn't put Sikhs on our own contracts. That was against Homeland Security Uniform Court. Code. But I, I went to DC and tried to explain to our clients, two, three, four star generals, heads of federal agencies, who we were. And in that, I thought I learned to advocate for my community. Our children with turbans are the most bullied in US schools, along with openly gay children. And so for any minority community, you develop this idea that in, in an open society, you have to stand up for yourself. That was my training. I spent about 10 years doing that. Um, and it worked. I could have lunch with the Attorney General of the United States because we had 6,000 people in his courthouses. Um, I could met, meet with senior military and intel leaders and on and on and on. But then Oak Creek happened in 2012. There was a shooting at a Sikh temple, Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Seven worshipers were killed by a white supremacist. And that morning I drove to work in DC and I realized that everybody was talking about us, that I didn't even have to complain about my community. And I also saw that it's very tiring for people to meet members of minorities who complain about themselves. At some point, a few sentences in, the eyes glaze over. For example, if I'd gone any further in explaining how difficult it might be to be a Sikh, your eyes might have started glazing over. You might have thought somewhere in your head, all right, buddy, get to the point. <laughs> What's, what are you talking about? And that morning I, I drove to work, the Pentagon had its flag, the next morning, the Pentagon had its flags at half mast. Uh, on the radio, there was a Sikh gentleman talking about who we were and then I got to Starbucks and the barista had my coffee ready because, because somehow she also knew that what my community had gone through and I realized everyone was advocating for me. I ended up on the board of an organization called the Institute on Religion and Public Policy and later joined the IRF Secretariat, which I wanna to talk to you about. And I also started going there by trying to advocate for Sikhs. And I realized, and to my shame, I realized that the other groups weren't doing that. They were supporting each other. 
advocacy has gone through the roof. We have the internet. We're more organized than we've ever been as a human civilization, yet discrimination is increasing as well. There was a point where we thought that the internet could help us solve this stuff, but what we're learning, what we have learned, is that it furthers discrimination and it further separates groups. We only have to look at the algorithms on YouTube, what Dr. Jürgen Smart was talking about, you know, you, you, you go down a rabbit hole. They will feed you the information to reconfirm your pre-existing biases and beliefs. That's what makes the most money there. Very easy to manipulate. So I, I, I started attending the International Religious Freedom Roundtable convened by the Earth Secretariat where I'm now the round chair. Any of you can join. We meet every week now. There are about a, a dozen governments there on a good week. We have 900 participating NGOs. And the single premise is that we stand up for each other. As much as it is tempting to talk about our plight as minority communities, and all of our faith groups are minority somewhere. None of us have the majority all over the world, so we know if we're engaged in our communities, we know what it's like to talk from a minority standpoint. Um, but, but, but the premise there is to stand up for each other. We, this has been going on for a decade. And, and what, I, what we've realized is that faith communities have not, in essence, stood up for each other globally. This idea that an attack on one of us anywhere in the, on the planet is an attack on all of us. We feel that way, but as a society, we, haven't, we don't have the vehicles to engage for each other, which is why the Earth Secretariat is working towards establishing 100 roundtables where people go to fight for each other, not for themselves. We're at about 28, 29 now. I want to tell you about what happened in Guatemala when we opened the first roundtable there. A large, one of the largest uh, mega churches in Latin America invited us. They are worried about their rights. They're worried about the far left. They think about Venezuela and shutting down any freedom of religious expression. So they wanted to bring faith groups together, but they were so divided in their country that no single religious group could convene everybody. They don't have the think tanks we have in Washington. So they asked us to come from DC with the State Department. At that point, it was Ambassador Sam Brownback uh, who gave opening remarks. They asked us to come and convene the first ever religious freedom roundtable in Guatemala. It just so happened, it was the first interfaith um, convening they had ever had where all religions were invited. Never in Guatemala, until last year, never in Guatemalan history had there been a full inclusive interfaith meeting and some really remarkable things happened. The first instinct they had was to point to the US as the model for inclusivity and religious freedom. And it bugs me a little. I had to explain to my friends in Europe why here in this country we couldn't serve in police uniform or in the military. And, I, and in my opening remarks, I said, you know, you can point to the United States, but in the 1800s, there was an extermination order against the Mormon community by the state of Missouri. So just because the US had its founding knowledge doesn't mean we have really protected our minorities. The Mormons moved on to Salt Lake City. Sure, they did an incredible amount, especially through Brigham Young University and of work and in um, getting religious freedom into the DNA of a society. But something <laughs> moved me to say, so if anybody here wants to harass a Mormon, I just want you to know the Sikhs are going to be there. The thing is, there's no Sikhs in Guatemala. <laughs> I try to find them. There's a couple that like to go to the resorts and they, they, somebody even got married there, but there's no Sikhs there. So nobody really knew who this guy in a turban was. But I said, if anybody mess, so if anybody messes with the Mormons here, the Sikhs will be there. There was about 600,000 Mormons um, in, uh, well, in Central America. <laughs> To which, and I didn't know the, the Mormons were there. To which a Mormon, you know, organizer there stood up and said, um, we are with the Mormon community and we, we don't really know who, who he is, but we just want to say, if anybody messes with any of you, the, 
Mormons will stand with you. And people, you know, it started standoffish. It was there's tension in the air. And that the chief rabbi of Guatemala stood up and explained the meaning of shalom. And then the, the, the gentleman who'd really invited us, who was a mega church pastor there, Cash Luna, tens of millions on social media, 12,000 seat mega church. He tries to say something and he starts crying. And religion after religion stood up and pledged their support for one another. It's very, very touching. This is at the first ever interfaith convening there. And I think our this idea of us cooperating and working for each other, not for ourselves, is incredibly underdeveloped. So advocating for Sikhs now has become very tiresome for me. I don't enjoy doing it. But when I go to these meetings, there is groups that will advocate for us, and they're doing that already. And um, it does get problematic. And it's, we have roundtables on Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and, and they we have really had to push through the idea that religious freedom doesn't mean the majority gets to tyrannize the minority. The evangelical and Muslim communities of Guatemala, Guatemala is a very conservative country. One of them said, we thought we hated Muslims, but the Muslims are telling us they hate gays, and we hate gays too. So now we're friends. We'll just fight the gays together. And those of us who came down from DC kind of went, oh no, what have we done? So the model is evolving into a freedom. Well, we addressed it, of course, with working groups to discuss it. You know, we got it into as best as we could into the church leaders' heads that this is not the exclusion of any marginalized group. But I want us to imagine for a second what happened. Well, something else that happened in Guatemala is the president of parliament came. The president of the country came. They invited us to a national, national prayer breakfast. They put us on national TV. When all the faith communities came together, the political leadership had to come and the press had to come. Now imagine if this could happen all over the world where an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us and faith groups from around the world stand together and raise their hands in opposition. It is very difficult. It's hard to, or to argue with like two or three ministers, but to argue with all of us when on social justice issues, we have many, many more agreements than we have disagreements. It's an incredible opportunity. So I think for our own faith groups and our own advocacy, I would just encourage each one of us to build the protection of another group into your work. And we have plenty of lobbyists here. We have plenty of social justice organizers here. We have ministry here. Include the protection of another group into your daily prayer. And then do that more than you think of protecting your own. Because before God, everyone is our own. Don't we all feel that? Isn't it a relief to be able to feel that? And then when they come for you, everyone stands with you. And on, on a larger scale, on a religious leadership scale, we've created a model for how faith communities can engage at a ministry level for others. And I'll discuss that in the breakout group. Um, but anyways, um, the stories and the magic kind of happens. We have, we have groups at these roundtables who refuse to talk refused to sit at the same in the same room and they slowly started to listen and within two or three years they're friends and they're tackling issues together the opportunity for that is huge and society needs it um, very very much back to you Ori thank you thank you so much Simran we have um, about a 15 or 16 minute window for our keynote panelist discussion at this point which means that um, Simran and Maggie and Charles and or Jack, together with Mark Jürgen Smeyer, uh, will have a conversation. I think the starting point might be a, a question directed towards Mark. And just to get things rolling, uh, I'm gonna direct a question to you, Mark, based in part on things you said and on what each of the other panelists said. Um, if you wouldn't mind putting together the following four words or concepts that inter, interact with each other for us. The first is the concept or term revelation, 
which stands at the beginning of every religious tradition. The second is interpretation, which is where every religious tradition goes after its beginnings when the prophet or prophets is or are gone. The third is present future that we cannot understand unless, and here's the fourth, we examine the past even when the past is painful. So I wonder if you might respond to those four terms uh, that seem to be so important to what each and every one of you has been speaking about from different angles in different ways. And panelists, please uh, unmute yourselves so that you can ask and charge in as you wish to do so. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, There's an interesting idea to reflect on these different uh, dimensions of, uh, of religiosity or spiritual seeking. Um, I, I think I'm going to think about that. <laughs> and I, I don't think I'm going to pick up each one of those um, okay. immediately, but um, I, I think instead what you what your comment uh, has kind of uh, touched off in my mind is the variety of ways of being religious. Uh, and and I, this was challenged to me uh, one of the first times I was in the Punjab. As a graduate student, I was in rural Punjab and I was doing a, a project on the religion of scheduled caste people, the untouchables of Northern. I was a political scientist, but I was interested in religion. So I wanted to do a, a, a project on the religion of Dalits or the farmer untouchable people of, of the Punjab. And I had a 60 page questionnaire all set up uh, you know, I was a social scientist, and I went out with my graduate students from Punjab University who, was going to, who were help, going to help me with my translations, and I had trouble with question number one, and question number two, the whole thing fell apart, and question number one was, what is your name? <laughs> well, but these people have different names for different purposes. Say, so, so, you want my caste name? Do you want my village name? Do you want my religious name? Do you want my my uh, uh, occupation name, what name do you want? They wanted to give the right answer. I said, well, oh, well, let's move on to the second question. Second question is, what is your religion? At that point, my graduate student turned to me and said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, religion. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, there is no single word in any Indian language for the Western term religion. I mean, we could use dharam, which means a kind of religious law. Uh, we could use pant, which is a fellowship of believer, believers. Uh, we could use mazab, which means specifically belief. Or we could use calm, which means a whole community uh, of, of believers, like a nationhood. What is it that you have in mind? And I said, you know, religion. <laughs> but there's so many different dimensions of religiosity. And for some to be religious is simply a matter of kind of ethnic affiliation, which is why you can have a secular Jew or a, a secular Muslim, someone who accepts the customs, but it doesn't go much more deeply than that. And then for other people, religion is, is a matter of faith. And that goes deep into the marrow of one's bones where one One's whole being is excited by the possibilities of spirituality. And sometimes people who are on this kind of path reject any kind of religious affiliation. I have a number of students who say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. And by what they, what they mean by that is that they reject religious affiliations. They are on a path of spirituality, which in their mind is deeper than that. And I respect, I respect that. Although it seems to me there are paths for that in every religious tradition, in including my own. For others, religion is a matter of ethics, of rule, of, of understanding the law, the customs. And for others, it is a matter of practice, of being faithful to the customs, often which are related to family issues. Religion is such a deeply complex and personal dimension of human experience. This is why every tradition, every Every, every community, every 
faith, uh, every uh, uh, ethnic community uh, from the beginning of time has had some form of religiosity. Even you could say animals have a certain kind of respect for the spiritual world. Uh, some animal behaviorists have seen remarkable examples of how the great apes, for example, respond to storms in a ritual manner. Is that a kind of religion? I don't know. I don't know. All I'm saying is that uh, we are, uh, your question has touched off to me the really miraculous variety of forms of religiosity, uh, which interact in so many different ways, uh, including the political ones that we've been talking about today, uh, where faith is then brought into, as I put it earlier, weaponized into a form uh, of political venture and a form of nationalism. Uh, but we should not abandon uh, so many uh, other aspects of a religious experience that are much more rich and, and much more uh, profound uh, than those of simply politicization. Great. I said, I would like to recognize you um, because your hand is up. So unmute yourself and please ask the question that you have. Yeah, I'm very um, persistent in asking this question because I just, it's just been on my mind for a while. Hi, um, I'm Aisha. I'm a research intern at Ruby Forum. So it's like, I'm mainly like researching about Islam in Eastern Europe. So I just want to ask you um, like two questions. The first one is, how do you think the focus on the Middle East as the like representation, like the main representation of Islam, like despite this, no, it's only like 20%, the Middle East is, and North Africa is only like 20% of the entire Muslim population. Why do you, how do you think the focus on that region as Islam center will affect the ethnic perspectives or like the nationalism um, that stems from that area? And my second question is, um, how do you think the current um, conflicts in Eastern Europe will affect other groups like non-Christians, such as like Muslims in Crimea or the Crimean Tatars in Ukraine or um, the rising Serbian nationalism in the Balkans? That's basically my question. So which of my panelists would like to address either of those questions? I'm happy to, but I think I'd lo love it if someone else would wish to do so. I'll, Go ahead, Charles. I'll, I'll take a little a swing at the first one. Um, a little bit. And um, I'm a person that 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 talks about this and I talk about it in a level of humanity and everybody's on the same playing field when I say this. But I also talk about it as somebody that, you know, studies uh, religious, religious freedom in America and the idea that our foreign policy, maybe our biggest foreign policy is something that is uh, doesn't reflect the idea of religious freedom for all or, or thinking of everybody the same way. And I say that to say your representation of uh, the Middle East being uh, where the Islamic or our, our Muslim friends are is not a, an accident. It is, especially in America, a way of saying, hey, here is the danger area. And since this is the danger area, uh, it's no coincidence that the, 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 the ally that we have to protect in the danger area are, uh, uh, is Israel. Uh, it's from that. And I'm not saying that shouldn't be protected in that way, but I like to tell truth about, about things. There's no way to not deny that, uh, you know, that is a part of why your question is why, is, why do we say that's the big representation? Because if you can put it in a more American's mind that this is the biggest threat, then we have to protect what is seen as our uh, biggest ally. And, and not the saying that uh, 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 Jewish or Israel, uh, people that live in Israel should not be protected, but I feel like they should be the same thing as Palestine and who else. So it's, it's not an accident that that is seen as the biggest threat because that can then say, yes, uh, we need to protect our biggest friend uh, in Israel. Now that idea of biggest friend is where I have a problem because that is brought out of uh, Zionism and Christian nationalism in, in my aspect, because the only reason we want to protect uh, Israel is because most people 
that line up under the Christianity, believe in the faith tradition of, oh, if you bless Israel, then you bless uh, Christianity, then you're going to bless America. And for my faith and for how I think about things, uh, that's, that falls short of love of everybody. And I, I think it's, it's not a coincidence that our policy and our representation is said in that way. And I just want to speak that truth. And, and I hope everybody can, uh, doesn't take that as a, a slander at, at, any, at anybody. Uh, to me, it's just, we have to know that that is a part of why it's that way. Simran, did you want to add something? I wanted to draw a, a very quick parallel to the Sikh faith where in India we're dealing with, with gay marriage in our churches, uh, we're decentralized. But in India, it's like if, if you are a Sikh and you, you come out as gay, then, then a response could be the fact that you're gay is a, is a disgrace to your entire religion. You know, whereas there's a study that came out last year uh, in Malaysia where 90% of millennial Sikhs uh, were uncomfortable saying there's anything wrong with being gay and 78% said it was, to it was totally equal. What are you talking about? So there's a, I said, have you as a kind of a millennial? I'm like right on the edge of, of being a millennial too. There's a huge rift happening with conservative home culture for faiths and Western, in this case, it's Malaysia, which is a conservative Muslim country, but let alone like what's going to happen in California if you ask you know, if, if the, the Sikh elders ask the grandkids to describe uh, their, their practice values, there's, is, we're in the process of a complete break between our home cultures and the way our youth think. And I think that is accelerating um, in a lot of faith groups. And I think the centers are shifting. And Aisha, as, as far as your Eastern European question is concerned, you know, the bright side of the, of, the, of the darkness of Vladimir Putin is that in trying to gain support from all the Russians, he has been friendly to the Jewish community. He's been friendly to the Muslim community, as well as being friendly, of course, to the Russian Orthodox community. So if, aside from the politics of his friendship, if there's even a scintilla of reality behind it out of convenience to himself, then that would suggest that what is developing in Eastern Europe perhaps won't have negative repercussions for the Muslim community. But obviously it is, it is difficult to say, going back to where Mark ended up in asking the question of the future and what he said earlier just a few moments ago, there's so many different directions in which we as a species can go, have gone, might go, will go, that it's really impossible to say for sure, it seems to me. But thank you for your questions. Any other comments from our panelists before we repair to our breakout rooms? All right, everyone said what he or she wanted to say or was bold enough to say. And I will leave it to our technology quizzes to disperse us to our breakout rooms at this point. The breakout sessions are about 45 minutes a piece and then we will reconvene as a group together, to use Simran's favorite word, uh, for our closing session.